Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the second day afternoon session of our Symposium on Conflict and Civility in Political Discourse, Where's the Line? Uh, my name is Pete Damiano. I direct the University Public Policy Center, and I'm on the faculty in the College of Dentistry. And this panel is the reason that we are here at this time of year. Uh, the question we thought was very important for a lot of different reasons as we've been talking about and the timing we thought to give attention was to try to put it as close to the Iowa caucuses as we could but yet still hopefully be able to hold out from the weather. On Wednesday morning that was a little questionable whether we timed this very well or not but today is a beautiful day and that worked out very well and we feel very fortunate to have uh, the group that we have with us today. I want to give a, a special thanks um, to Bill, Bill, how do you pronounce your last name? Keedle. Keedle, um, who works with the Johnson County Republican Party. He jumped in on hours notice, literally, when Matt Strawn, the chair of the Republican Party, came down with strep and was not able to make it. So I want to give Bill a, a special thanks, and then I will allow Dean to make the introductions beyond that. But I will introduce our guest moderator, who is also well regarded and well known in his own right and some of you saw Michael Goucher this morning and Dean from having grown up in Milwaukee Dean is sort of Iowa's Michael Goucher if you will he is a radio and TV journalist and does all other kinds of things but on top of that has covered the Iowa caucuses for many many years so with that I will turn it over to Dean. Thank you, Pete. And uh, I'll just say that uh, we're going to make this somewhat unconventional. If you can't tell, we're starting out unconventional. Sue Dvorsky has promised uh, she has a tow line here to uh, hold me so I don't fall off. <laughs> and I've, I've been assured that we have a person back here. Derek Willard has paramedic training. And so if <laughs> uh, we're going to begin uh, this afternoon uh, with... Um, Carolyn Tolbert, who is with the University of Iowa Department of Political Science. She's also an author and has co-authored a new book that's just been published by the University of Chicago Press. It's called Why Iowa? And if you will, those of you who are back here, just excuse my back. I'll try to turn back once in a while and acknowledge that you're there. But uh, I'm sitting out here so that I can make eye contact with our panelists and and I've told them that this isn't going to be, although we will start off with a short presentation here by Carolyn, but we're just going to have a, a coffee table type discussion here. And uh, so that's the way it won't be lecturing or presentations by any means, although we will start out with Carolyn just giving a brief overview of the caucus system. And then we're going to just have a round table discussion here. Uh, you've already... Uh, been introduced to Carolyn Talbert. I've talked about her already. Bill Keetle is chair, as you've heard, of the Johnson County Republican Party, and he's an Iowa City attorney. Uh, I, I just became acquainted with Bill anew here and learned that I knew his dad, who was head of the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics Department of OB Jim for many years, and uh, the, so I know that family name very well. And then Sue Dvorsky, I know Sue from having been on Iowa Press and over the years uh, as a resident here in Coralville. Uh, Sue now is chair of the Iowa Democratic Party, as you know. So Carolyn, let's, uh, let's hear from you. Okay. Um, it is an honor to be here, and I must tell you that when I learned about this discourse conference, um, I thought to myself that the caucuses is, actu is actually one of the places where we see rather civil discourse in presidential elections, and that is because negative campaigning, extensive negative campaigning, is somewhat taboo in the caucuses. Um, most campaigns are run in mass media ads, run on television ads, radio, uh, radio campaigns, um, and newspaper ads, and the caucuses are really unique in politics because retail politics or face-to-face -face politics is very important, um, meeting candidates, higher political knowledge, um, and, and quite a bit of um, um, civic engagement in, in selecting candidates. So my co-authors and I have this book, Why Iowa, that was just published, and of course, as I tell my students, and I'm lucky to have one of them here in the back room, um, that everybody asks, well, why not Colorado? Why not Michigan? 
why not my state? Um, and as um, presidents have become more important in American politics over time, this, uh, this act of picking presidents becomes more important. Um, and by the time we get to the general election, our choice is usually down to two, with potentially a third party candidate that will not win. So the most important decision in some ways in picking presidents is right here in the presidential nomination process. One of the things that has long been convention um, in studies of the presidential nomination process is that the winner of Iowa rarely becomes president. There are some except exceptions. But the old saying or the conventional wisdom is New Hampshire picks presidents, Iowa picks corn. Um, or maybe it's the other way, <laughs> Iowa picks corn and New Hampshire picks presidents. Um, and if you look at the winners um, before 2000, um, the winner of the Iowa caucus in many cases did not go on to become the president. And what we argue in this book is that since 2000 there has been a punctuated change, a punctuated um, change where winning Iowa has become more important in selecting, or not winning Iowa, doing better than media expectations is actually what it is, has become more important in selecting um, candidates for both parties in large part because of the shift to new media and the viral effect of coverage of candidates coming out of Iowa. You know we don't have very many delegates to give away. You know we don't even give away those delegates until June because of our caucus system that takes the entire year. The candidates are not coming here for our delegates. The candidates are coming here because we are the first water test of how salient their campaigns are. And we have, we are increased, we argue in this book that Iowa is becoming increasingly important. And in this way, I can tell you, um, what, what our data shows is that the, ch that the change in media coverage candidates receive before and after the Iowa caucuses is a primary predictor of how well candidates do in New Hampshire and then go on in terms of winning, um, prime, uh, primaries nationwide. And let me give you an example. Do you guys know why Iowa goes first? Do you know how that happens? It wasn't actually, they didn't act in 1972 when Iowa chose to move its, its date for the caucuses way up. It wasn't to become first and yes. become the media focus and help pick candidates so primarily. It was because we have this this caucus system where you have to have 30 days between each of the caucuses. And so in order to get in all of these, the districts and the precincts and the county, they had to move it all the way back. And that is the caucuses first and then the county convention. convention. Right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And in 1972, it didn't really matter, actually. And in 1976, along came a no-name, Jimmy Carter. He yes. had no money, he had no name recognition, and he had no standing in the polls. And he decided, I'm going to put all my chips into this little state Iowa because it's little, because I can campaign here without a large war chest. And he came in as an unknown Georgia governor, and I, I've said for a long time that the program at that time on Iowa Public Television, Iowa Press, uh, was not statewide at that time yet because Iowa Public Television wasn't a statewide network yet but that Jimmy Carter came in, we put him on the air, and pretty much introduced him to Iowa, and in a, 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 you know, a little bit, you might say, gave him a springboard, at least in Iowa, that launched him into the right. White House. And what, what um, Dean is saying here is very important, because this book is saying that Iowa is so important, and Iowa is becoming more important because of media attention. Iowa. It's not winning Iowa. It's doing better than expected. It turns out Jimmy Carter in 1976 came in second to undecided. But because he was because he was coming from nowhere to second, he was considered the media darling. And in 2008, by all by all intentions, Hillary Clinton what had been selected the winner of the nomination, and that. In that June or July, she had the most name recognition, the most money, the most media coverage. And by losing slightly to Obama in the caucuses, she failed to exceed media, uh, media expectations. And Obama, again, the underdog, losing Iowa in a similar way as Carter, exceeded media expectations. And so it's this game 
Iowa is so important because of the media and because of what the expectations are. And we can think about this in through 12. Romney, we again are talking about Romney, but poor Romney in Iowa had a hard time in 2008. He had the name recognition, the most money, the most media coverage in July. He spent more than any other Republican candidate in Iowa. And then a no-name, Huckabee, beat him in the Iowa caucuses, which fatally wounded him going into the New Hampshire primary. Um, and then, and basically he was gone. So I can show you very quickly a couple slides. This is from October of um, 30, for, uh, October 31, 2008. So you know, the caucuses were in January, so you know how yeah. much later. And Obama is saying here at a campaign speech in Des Moines on the day of the Iowa caucuses, my faith in the American people was vindicated. What you started here in Iowa has swept across the nation. So the people of Iowa, I will always be grateful to you all. And this is sincere. He knows that he would not be in the White House if it wasn't for Iowa in 2008. Um, Here's the little story I told you, the counterfactual, imagine 208 without the Iowa caucuses. Just start with the New Hampshire primary, erase us, likely. We would have had um, Clinton as the Democratic nominee and Mitt Romney as the Republican nominee. So this sequential process that starts with Iowa and has a caucus, not a primary, these are all rules. We don't have to let Iowa go first. Iowa doesn't have to have a caucus. It could have a primary. We could all have a national primary. It's fundamental in the choices of the candidates we get. And as I talk regularly, economic policy, foreign policy, tax policy, health policy, and you name it for the things that our presidents do and how important it is for this country. Um, so here, um, in exceeding initial expectations, the momentum from Iowa may have helped Obama, similar to Carter. 30 years later, the same path. Um, and today, the Republican candidates are again looking at Iowa in 212. And I think a really important part of this discussion, I hope, will be on the 212 candidates and what we know and what that means that we might predict. Um, and here's a similar way that an election rule matters. Everybody knows in 2000 that if we didn't have the Electoral College, that um, Gore would have been the president and not George W. Bush. It was, it was one rule, one system that changed a very historic outcome in a similar way with how Iowa Obama likely would not have been elected in 2008. Um, oops, sorry. So the rules matter. Iowa caucus, um, sequential rules. Should we change the rules? There's always debate every four years about changing the rules. It's very interesting, very quiet about keeping Iowa and New Hampshire first. Um, no, no discussion issue, really, um, relatively speaking. I used to direct the Hawkeye Poll. Um, Fred Bemke, who's my colleague in political science, is now the director. Um, it's a wonderful platform, and we collect survey data like the Des Moines Register um, of likely caucus goers every four years, um, and we have new information. 208 was very unique, wide open caucuses. Um, the Des Moines Register recorded more than 2,100 candidate visits. We have on both sides, on the day of the caucuses, 43,000 stories in Google News. To give you an example today, Penn State, if you Google Penn State with both the president and their head coach retiring, 12,000 stories. So you can see what an incredible, explosive media story this is on the day of the caucuses. Um, and voters highly engaged on both sides. Turnout of the voter age population was used early 6% in the Iowa caucuses. In 2008, it was 12%. Um, and this, I just think, is interesting. This is from our surveys. And this shows you, we asked each one of our respondents, did you get a live phone call from Obama, from Edwards, from Clinton, from Richardson, from Biden, from Dodd? Did you, did someone knock on your door? Did someone send you an email? Did someone call you? And you can see that, um, Obama leads the Democratic candidates in basically all of these forms of contacting. He came into the caucuses with a very powerful grassroots campaign and network um, that was from his community organizing in Chicago, very effective in Iowa. Clinton didn't have that kind of background and network. And Romney, um, this is the Republican version of this, Romney used his money primarily in 2008 for mass media campaigns and not the retail policy. 212 is very different because neither, none of the candidates are visiting Iowa very much. However, that 43,000 stories will still hit on caucus day. And so whether they're here or not, what we do will make a big difference. So, um, 
I think maybe. Well, let me ask. Yeah, so, just, hold on just a second. I, you, you've raised so many points there, but I want to ask Sue. <laughs> will what happens on January third really make a difference this year, Sue? I know the main caucus is not in your party this year, but what do you think? You know, I think. Um, first of all, let let me thank the uh, Fork and Brock Institute. Let me thank Pete Mathis, Pete Damiano. Pete Damiano, this is a, a really interesting discussion and a, and a great time to have it. So, thank you all for being here. Um, thank you to Bill. You know, when when Matt called last night and said I'm too sick to come, um, in the spirit of civility, I accused him of just being a giant chicken who couldn't take it. <laughs> um, but he. he he apparently is really sick. But um, Bill Keitel is also not, not just a long, long time and, and quite beloved Iowa City family. He's a high school classmate of my husband, so I'm glad we're not sitting bride and groom side because Bob might actually be sitting over there just to, <laughs> to give Bill the boost. So thank you for stepping in. Um, you know, this year is going to be a remarkable, um, it's going to be remarkable to see what happens after this year. We are going to be caucusing on the Democratic side in, in every precinct. We are going to be doing it because, as Carolyn talked about, the beginning, the, the sort of the genesis of the media attention on the one part of the caucus that is the presidential preference and delegate selection. The actual bulk of the caucus is an organize, it's an organizational night for both parties. In fact, the, the way that we pick delegates and presidential preference is so different and so, um, I would say, sort of um, generally stereotypical of the, of the difference between the two parties that the, the rest of it, the media attention, the national media attention, um, maybe Chuck Todd cares about it because Chuck Todd does love him some eye when he really understands this. I don't know that anybody else cares about the expansion and retention of the Senate majority, say, from our point of view. But it's going to start there. Um, Why is that? Because the organization that's required for us to succeed in 2012 will start that night. Um, and I'll say just as a disclaimer first, just so I don't have to keep saying it, and remind you that, of course, I am speaking here as the chief partisan. So, you know, take take anything. I say, When I say we, I, I mean, you know, my team, as it were. Um, so the the pathway for Christy Vilsack to beat Steve King starts at the caucuses in those 39 counties. The Because uh, you are selecting delegates that night to the county convention, or why is it, I mean, you're, it's a activist caucus. Why does the start of her defeating uh, Steve King in that fourth district, why does that start that night? You're, you're singing to the choir that night. But that's the night that we get people in the door and signed up. That's the first place we start with that list. That's the place where we start that uh, neighbor to neighbor, the thing that Obama used so effectively. You mean you get independents there as well as no. Democrats? No. Oh. No, but what we get is that activist base beginning to be gener to be getting to be really energized. You know, the, when they when they write the history of eight with a little more distance, so that it's actually you know it's not people sucking up and, you know, it, it's actually history. Pluff and Axelrod came in with this incredible idea that looks now like, it was, you know, it was the idea that blew out, um, that, you know, was going to just be, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to do this grassroots thing. Well, the reason that that worked, and, and I think Pluff and Axelrod are two of the smartest guys in the world, but this was not a new idea. All they did was piggyback on how the Democratic caucuses work, which is to say it is groups of neighbors getting together in the school gym, talking civilly about civic issues. One person gets her five. Those five get their five. It, it's a giant pyramid scheme. It's a, that's how you organize. So when they came in with this idea, this was not new, and it fit perfectly, like a hand in a glove with the way we do things in Iowa. Did I note that you had a, something to say there or... Oh, I would just say that our book about it is actually based on extensive survey data. So while the media may have said, you know, Obama won because of his grassroots organizing, Obama won because of his experience in Chicago, our data actually shows 
how many people, everything in this book is based on a lot of empirical right. data. So I, it, it's not a history book, but it's also not a an opinion book. So it's, no. uh, you understand. I was Absolutely. Saying. No, yeah. you're doing an analysis, but I'm, I'm talking about the broader narrative. Right, the broader narrative of how. The conventional wisdom that kind of took hold. Bill, uh, pull the mic it. over to you so that uh, you can get word in here edgewise uh, on the Republican side. Now, she has described, uh, not in detail yet, but I hope we can go back and say how her caucus differs from yours. But it does in that you are just really taking a straw poll at night, aren't you? And not picking delegates? We have the party organization function as well. Uh, it's done a lot differently, and I'm looking forward to hearing a plain statement of how the Democrats do it, I can because tell you I'm that. slightly <laughs> confused. Frankly, I'm a little confused, and I don't mean that in a catty way. I just mean, since I don't go to their caucuses, I haven't lived with it and seen it firsthand. If you think you're confused from the outside, you'd be so confused in it that, honest to God, I, I can tell. It, yeah. Go ahead, Carol. Okay, because th this is what we do. We have to convey this to our students so I can convey it to you. So primary differences between the Republicans and Democrats. The Democrats have a public vote. They don't have a secret ballot. You vote by actually standing, standing or raising your hand. The Republicans have a private ballot. The Republicans have one ballot. One, you cast one ballot. The Democrats, you use a form of proportional representation with a threshold. Believe it or not, it's what they do in a lot of European countries. They call it being viable. Well, they call it being viable, but what it means is that everybody votes for their first candidate, and they go to the different parts of the room. But if a candidate like Kucinich does not have at least 15% of the people who are in that gym that night, then there is what's called a realignment process, but all it is is a second vote where all the Kucinich people get to go and move over to some candidate that is viable, which was Edwards, Clinton, and Obama on that night. So, And doesn't uh, the, don't the Clinton people come and try to persuade the Kucinich people to come over to us? Right there, you're standing, and there's two rounds of voting, and there's a threshold, and there's a period of, of dis, like kind of debating and discussing. Mm -hmm. So, and until this year... The Democrats use a proportional representation system to allocate the delegates nationwide, and the Republicans use winner take all. But this year, I hear the Republican Party is using is allocating the delegates proportionally and nationwide. And Sue, you call that being civil when Kucinich's <laughs> delegates or, or supporters are standing over here, and Obama's or Clinton's come over and try to raid them? And that's civility. Actually, I think. What it is, it almost always is incredibly civil. It is almost always incredibly, at the same time, heated and passionate. I don't think that there there is a real difference, I think. And I think we need to be careful with it. Because I think this conversation about political civility um, can, can get to be really used as either a weapon or it can get to be used as an excuse. It is almost always civil. Um, that night. Coralville won the mother precinct. 240 people in the gym in Coralville's elementary school, which was at one point its junior high. Bob was the precinct chair. He was an Obama supporter. Hillary Clinton's supporters were not viable the first go around in Coralville won on that night. Now, I couldn't believe that that was true because the other thing that happens is you're very isolated. You know, now there's Twitter and everything, but really four years ago, people weren't Twittering. So you had cell phones, but you didn't really know what was going on. And I thought to myself, oh, good Lord, this can't be true. And if this happens here, Bob, we will be accused of having, you know, this won't be good. So I'm out in the girls' bathroom, the boys' bathroom, up on both levels. I'm hollering, anybody out here? I asked personally two friends from Edwards to get out of their group and go to Hillary Clinton's group to make them viable so we could have the conversation. It is extremely, it can be extremely passionate, but it is almost always civil. And I think the reason is that the closer you are, if Matt were sitting here, what Matt and I would, would be able to talk about in a different level than Bill and I can talk about is the work that we do together as state party chairs. Now, I know that Matt Strawn has three kids under the age of six. I know that his middle daughter broke her arm when he was last off at the RNC fighting for the calendar. I suggested to him that his 
if his wife would be well within her rights to do some kind of physical harm to him when he got home <laughs> with the baby's cast. I don't suggest violence. I was just saying <laughs> I lived through many years by myself with young children for, you know, a man who was out doing the public's work. So I said, I just think you should be careful there, and is all I said. He, he did his JD work here at Iowa. Now, I don't know if he were a cyclone, if I could, you know, muster up that kind of thing. But knowing all that about each other, he knows that we've got two kids, one at you and I, one here. Um, knowing all that about each other, it, Bill and Bob having a relationship, that makes it very difficult. A part of it's I would nice, part of it's maybe a generational thing, but that makes it very difficult for me to, to snipe at Matt on political issues because I know him. You know, we sit in the makeup room thing at Iowa Press, and then we got to go back out into the press gaggle together. And I think that that's one of the things about the civility in the caucuses. It can be pa very passionate. It can be yelling. There are people, and, and I, I look around this room and see longtime Democratic caucus goers um, in Johnson County. And you know that there are people. Bob and I got married in 88, and I still identify myself as a Simon girl, and he still talks about Bruce Babbitt with a certain <laughs> glowing thing. So it is not the case that these things happen easily, but I do think they happen civilly. If you want to know just a little fun fact, we were obviously in the, in the poll, in the field, and we were interviewing likely caucus goers from across the state, up to the caucus and post the caucus. Thanks to Kevin Light over there, by the way, who gave us the, uh, Survey Research Center to do so. Um, and we asked a question, um, why do you caucus? And, and is it because you care about an issue to support your party because it's a civil, is your civic duty, or is it fun? And surprisingly, more than 50% of our respondents said caucusing was fun. Now, you could not convince your average primary voter in Florida, Michigan, or California to believe that the duty to participate in politics would be fun. But caucuses are fun. Bill, uh, and we'll continue the discussion, uh, and if you've got other points, uh, the rest of you uh, jump right in. But I, I want to get you into the conversation here because... From what we've heard, and, and I've been at caucuses, and I've covered them, so I know the system, but they're, they're, they're changing a little bit, and I want to talk a little bit about the social media that you mentioned and how that might be changing uh, the nature of the caucuses. But there's another wrinkle this year, and that is a group called Anonymity, another called Occupy Wall Street or Des Moines or Iowa City or whatever it is, who think that maybe they can come and infiltrate and disrupt the caucus system. It seems to me, the way you've described it and the research you've done, that that is fertile ground for being able to come in and disrupt. Maybe not uh, stand up and yell and shout, but be a part of the system, because if you register as a Republican ahead of time, you would be welcome at that caucus. You can register on caucus day. There we have. No, you don't need to be registered. Well, let me okay. comment a, a little bit about the uh, the change, the Occupy uh, Wall Street, Occupy Iowa group. What uh, Mr. Borg is referring to is Father Cordaro and uh, I think maybe David Goodner and some people from Des Moines have suggested that they would like to disrupt the Republican caucus process. And the start point for disruption is to interfere with the campaign headquarters of the candidates in Des Moines. So far, uh, I have only heard of this being generated from Des Moines, but I don't want to, you know, encourage people to, to do this in Iowa City. The general rule is if you register uh, as a Republican on the night, you can participate fully in the Republican caucus as if you'd been with the party since Dewey. But but is it that but don't you have to live in the precinct? Yes. See so you, that's what's, you're required to live yeah. in the precinct. Yeah. But uh, remember that we have some pretty uh, loose rules about who lives where. Uh, College uh, Green Park in Iowa City is located in Iowa City twenty. So we'll take a look at Iowa City twenty and see if we have folks coming in uh, to the caucus who give us their address uh, 
shall we say, the 400 block of College Street, uh, even number. Um, and uh, then uh, we'll have uh, a lot of uh, opportunity for people to, uh, I, I don't want to discuss the strategies that a, a truly disruptive person might use, but we'll have some things in place uh, that might not uh I called it fertile. Liking. I called it fertile ground. So what you're really confirming is that, yeah, the process is fertile ground. Well, any process can be misused. An election can be misused. Look at those folks in Philadelphia who uh, lined up to prevent uh, little old ladies from voting in their precinct. They said, "We're not going to let you vote today, ma'am," and they confronted voters. And when the uh, Justice Department was asked to look into this, they declined. I think if that had happened in the South and the people had been wearing sheets, it would have been a major lawsuit and uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center would have been in it and everything. So there, even an election process is fertile ground if you're determined enough to interfere with your neighbor's rights. But Carolyn, do you think, and I'll get to you in a minute, Sue, you think that this might give Republican candidates pause about how that caucus night is going to go because they've got so much writing on that night? I feel like Anonymous particularly um, has been most affected using media, the Internet, breaking into accounts, publicizing secret documents. Um, that's really, you know, they brought down some CEOs. I I, I just, I'm not, po po you know, which, uh, Robert, is it Gary? Is it the Gary scandal? Do you know what, what I'm talking about? No. no, you don't know. I hate that anonymous broke into his email account. He worked for the federal government um, and did some but what you're saying yeah. is they're sophisticated and they know how to do things. Uh, Technology-wise, yeah. but in terms of enough bodies in enough caucuses where there are actual straw polls that, you know, are are allocated to different candidates, I don't see it. Sue? But maybe I, I'll be wrong. Well, you know, and I don't want to give this um, more attention than um, than it needs to have, partly because I don't, I'd like to not give it attention at all. The... the the Republican Party of Iowa and the Iowa Democratic Party, there is no daylight between us when we work on calendar issues with the RNC and the DNC. And I will tell you that from the state party perspective, there is no daylight between us when we talk about the security of the caucus system that people in Iowa on both sides, on both parties, have fought for for a very long time. So this is one point, of, and really maybe the only point in all of 2011 and 2012 on which I agree with the governor, but um, the governor, Matt, and their people up at the state party level that you know set up the caucuses, and we are all in agreement that um, that the caucus process is at its heart small d democracy with neighbors talking civilly with each other about civic issues. It will not be disrupted. Um, there will be, and and I think that the thing that they're that the Republican side is, is, I'm sure, spending a great deal of attention on, but so would we, is how their numbers get reported, because that will matter on that night a lot, and I am absolutely confident that people much smarter than I am um, are going to guarantee the security and safety of those numbers. Let me comment on that. Uh, first of all, I want to agree and completely with what Sue said about because I watch Iowa Press, okay? I have had a chance to see Sue and Matt Strawn on Iowa Press talking about the calendar issue. When, when Florida tried to jump ahead in the process, and so to say that Iowa, that there was no question Iowa was going to be first, there was a period of time when a few other states, Florida, Nevada, and South Carolina, were jockeying for first or second position. And that has been resolved uh, really by the joint action of the two party chiefs at the state level in Iowa who just planted the flag in the ground and said we're going to go on January 3rd and if New Hampshire wants to jump back before Christmas they're certainly welcome to do that but they won't do that. 
it, it gets a little complicated. It's like musical chairs, and nobody wants to be the last one with a seat. Uh, it's about that elementary school, really, at the top level. But hasn't hasn't the jealousy uh, over Iowa and New Hampshire being lead off in the nation? Yes, it has uh, played havoc with the scheduling, but it seems also that there is uh, an insidious, <laughs> I don't want to say plot, but at least it seems to be successful this year in taking the spotlight off the Iowa campaign. Yes, you know, in 2008, we had both Democrats and Republicans uh, in this state with no incumbent or not even uh, uh, a likely successor to the pre vice president, successor to the presidency. So we had wide open campaigning and all intense campaigning. It seems to be a, a lot less this time. And it seems uh, that the debates that are just nonstop, there was one last night and there was another one I think this weekend on Sunday, I believe, but it's just been nonstop. It seems to me the candidates don't have time hardly to be in Iowa because they're preparing, and that takes a lot of time, because of the high-stakes national debates yeah. that are being held in other states. And it's, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, I would just say that I don't think it's because of the, the parties or jealousy from other states. It's, I think the media follows the candidates and the candidates haven't, the Republican candidates haven't been right. in Iowa very much. That's, and, and part of that might be because Romney really spent a lot of time and a lot of money in the state. And 208 wasn't very fun. And he's the front runner right now. And the other candidates are following Romney. And you know, so it, it, how much is that why they're here or not here? Well, and they're not in the four. You know, Nevada and South Carolina were put in by both parties, I think, to address the very real issues of demographics in New Hampshire and Iowa that, you know, um, rural issues, uh, racial demographics. And so Nevada and South Carolina were put in there. And the RNC and the DNC really working off of a model developed by the IDP and the RPI with more cooperation at the national level than they've ever shown. We've done this for 40 years. They, they, the, the, that calendar was set with more cooperation than ever. They're not in any of the four states. I can tell you that. It is not the case that um, you asked about this or Glover did or somebody asked Matt about this. Where are they? Yeah. And, you know, bless his heart, he had a thing. Yeah. But, but, but I felt bad for him because they're not here. So whatever right. they say, you can look at a map. The register's got this great thing, you know, where you pinpoint where they are. It's like blank. That's right. um, but they're not in New Hampshire either. They're not in Nevada, and they're not in South Carolina. The candidates have apparently this time pretty much, you know, bypassed the early state strategy with this series of debates that, um, you know, Romney was here like two days ago. Yes. And Governor Romney was here a couple of days ago, and he was talking about, uh, you know, you can get to know me by what I'm saying. And I thought at the time, that's an odd construction because really the beauty of this system when it worked was that we they got to know us, that we were, you know, it, they weren't talking at us. There was some opportunity for listening as well. And that was why you made this pitch on early states where you didn't have to spend a gazillion dollars on media, that you could get to people. You could talk to real people, real nurses, real teachers, real farmers, real, you know, workers, um, families. And this, this having the debates like this, these, this succession of by now the same players saying the same things and Newt does his shtick about, you know, the moderators are the problem and they all have their thing, has completely obviated yes. the need for them to campaign anywhere. Uh, I can't agree. Naturally, uh, Sue is seeing fewer of the presidential candidates this year because President Obama is expected to be renominated. We're seeing all of them. Uh, Bob Vanderpotts created an organization called The Family Leader and had a program starting in January of bringing every presidential candidate who would agree into Iowa City, uh, either Pella or Ankeny, or Ames and Sioux Center. Uh, in other words, three stops across the state with all the media markets covered. And the ones here in Iowa City were at the Union, and he has had uh, Newt, 
San, Santorum, Bachman, uh, Pilenti. Paul, Pilenti when he was in. Uh, I don't think Huntsman and Romney, no. not Romney. No. But uh, he's had most of them. And uh, it's been very informative to meet them. And they've all come in with other things. Santorum has uh, made a point of visiting all 99, 99 Iowa counties claiming he's done a Grassley. Well, we'll see if he does it every year like Grassley does. Well, he can't break, but, but Bill, he's done 99 counties. He's done the thing that we say you're supposed to do. Bless his heart, Rick Santorum can't break, what is it, two, three? He, he's, he can't break, it's not working. And Bachman, um, of all the candidates, had the most candidate visits in Iowa. And his Ron Paul next, I think. Yeah. Um, but if you look at the leaders, well, Herman Cain and Romney are leading in the Iowa Hawkeye polls and in the Des Moines Register polls. Mm -hmm. Relatively speaking, very few visits compared to that number of 2,100, even if you divide it in half. So it's only 1,000, which would be for only one party having a nominating event. And I think what's kind of interesting about this debate strategy, the multiple debates, that would be what we would have if we had a national primary. Think about it. A national primary, everybody votes on one day, then you're going to have television, radio, and mass media coverage of the candidates in a forum that everybody can hear. But we're moving toward it, aren't we? Well, I'm not sure. God, if last night, uh, seriously, if, if last night doesn't push us away from a national primary driven by uh, a weekly debate, I don't know what would. What, what has it done to civility? In, in the campaign. Oh, it's punished incivility. Perry was uh, quite incivil toward uh, Romney in an earlier debate, and I think had uh, has paid a price for that. And part of that was he was egged on by the moderators to con be confronted toward Romney. The other thing, and uh, enabled this is, I also sound like a new uh, supporter, which maybe I am. But, uh, uh, for example, uh, in the early going, while Pawlenty was still in the race, there was a great attempt by some of the moderators to uh, have Pawlenty pick a fight with Romney about the uh, so-called Obamacare from Massachusetts. And Pawlenty refrained from doing it the first time, and then the press take was, oh, he's too Minnesota nice, he didn't take his chance. Now, he doesn't have enough guts to do this, so we'll write him off. And then he came back uh, in the next debate and made a tepid attempt, and they said, well, now he's uh, ruining his uh, franchise, and so we got to get rid of him, and now he's out of the race. Well, Carolyn, it, it, do you agree that we're moving away from retail politics into some incivility promoted by media? No, I, I don't think we can dismiss Iowa. And I think that, again, that how Iowa votes and how New Hampshire votes well, is going to Well, not dismiss. Not dismiss right. the effect. But, uh, but, but I can tell you one thing, that not only is it harder for citizens to caucus, it's not getting up and voting one cast of a vote, but it's staying for two hours on a cold January night. You have to really know many candidates. You have to be more knowledgeable, engaged. Our data shows a large percentage of likely caucus scores gave money, but it's harder on the candidates to, to really do a good job in New Hampshire and Iowa than it is to show up for national debates that are televised. Um, and you're, you're letting the um, announcers give a lot of power in those debates. So some of the candidates, Huntsman, Perry, Ron Paul, would say they didn't get to make closing comments. It's kind of like being told to sit on the well, bench. Do you think, Sue, I, and I'll let you, well, you say what you're going to say first. Well, I'm going to disagree with my good friend Bill on this, because here's the problem I see. This, this, this and I, I don't want to oh, criticize too harshly um, the former speaker in case that is your guy. But I will say this, if the debates are how we're going to do this, then the purpose was, it is not, the moderators, I don't believe, are trying to incite and foment, you know, riot between the eight or 12 or whatever Republican candidates to get the TV. It's because if this is how we're going to vet them, they have to do that with one another. They have to separate themselves one from another. That is not a moderator's trick. If this is the way we're going to pick, if this is the way the, the Republican um, voters and independents and primaries where they can do that are going to be picking the person who is going to run against the sitting president of the United States, 
They have to separate themselves from one another. I would suggest that Polanyi's out because he couldn't set, he couldn't make a compelling case for his own candidacy. But if that's how some people who are attending Bill Keitel's uh, caucuses here in Johnson County are getting to view the Republican selection is by debates and not in somebody's living room or in the Coralville Town Hall, then that's all that they're seeing of that person is the conflict. And, I, and again, last night I thought, it, I have watched most of them because it's like, I feel like it's like a job requirement now. It's like homework. But I, I tell you, last night was just, I thought it was terrible. Now, In what way? Well, from a, from a purely, from, from my job now, every week that they do these, I think, okay, let's score. Because... I just don't, I don't see a presidential, I, I just don't see it as presidential. And I did, I do try. I, I really do try. Like, I, I'm trying to listen for the, the kernel of truth, and mm -hmm. I can't find it. I can't find enough. I do believe that Mitt Romney looks like the, the end of the end of the road result, but I don't know. They've all had a month mm -hmm. in the sun. Newt has not had it yet. Santorum hasn't had it yet. Um, Kane's taken a long time to have his. It's kind of eaten up time that the speaker, you know, might come to that to that level of being the guy that's not Romney for that month. But boy, if this is the way we do it, gosh, I just kind of worry as a citizen. And do you worry about the future of the caucuses and the influence of Iowa? Mm -hmm. Yep. But I think well, that every I, chair I does. I have to disagree with this respectfully because... <laughs> I've watched them all, too. Maybe I've missed one. Yeah. And I've learned the weakness and the strength mm -hmm. of almost every candidate. I think that these, as a speaking as a Republican who's going to be called upon to make a selection, and I would say that I there's a, the old saying that there are two and a half tickets out of Iowa. Yeah. But I say it a little differently. I say Iowa performs a great public service for the party and the nation by submitting to a whole lot of fools in order to identify the two or three people who have presidential uh, timber. And uh, I've uh, formed a conclusion. I. I ran it as a process of elimination, and I'm not going to share it with, with this room, but some of them are too angry. Some of them are nuts. Some of them are uh, too Johnny One Note. And uh, I would say that uh, we will, that Iowa is likely to do a very good job of sending three candidates forward who will be qualified to serve as president and effectively run against President Obama. So I think we're going to do our job this year. And because Iowa votes first, and because the media attention will be so great on caucus night, Iowans will still carry that, as you say, that burden for the country to sort out the candidates and to put forward. And as I argue, Romney can lose, but not by too much on caucus night because the expectation yeah. is that he's still the media front runner. It's okay. He, he's going to go into New Hampshire primary fairly strong because that's his region as the Massachusetts governor. So what he can't do is lose by too much. Uh, I'm going to change the subject uh, abruptly here. We may want to come back to current uh, horse race politics here. but. With Maggie Tinsman sitting here in the front row, I listened to a presentation on women in politics uh, this, just before noon. Diane Weistrom was here just a moment ago, and I think that sh she's on a panel that succeeds us. So this question comes out of uh, the, the thinking that I heard this morning. Do you think, Sue, that the caucuses have had any effect on gender equality and encouraging or discouraging Women in politics. I think of Liddy Dole. You may think of, of oh, Hillary Clinton. Didn't do well in Iowa. In fact, Liddy Dole dropped on out after the straw poll. You know, I'm not. 
I don't know that I'm qualified, and, and, as you say, with Senator Tinsman, with the kind of women that are sitting in this room, I don't even feel qualified to, to go with that. Because I was an early and strong Obama supporter, I believe that there were other reasons. I don't believe it was the caucus process. Now, I don't know about Oh, Mrs. So there's Dole. those who say I retail know. politics in Iowa, she didn't tailor her campaign to to that kind of politic campaigning. And so I would say that that's, that was a failure to tailor the campaign to the needs of the individual state. I, do you know what I'm saying? Yes, I, I don't do. know that it's yep. caucuses. I think Hillary Clinton was is and was a spectacular retail politician. She is fabulous with people. She connects and, you know, I think other decisions were made in the campaign that probably they weren't as nimble, maybe, mm -hmm. but I never made a judgment on that because we weren't in it and it, and I know that that was difficult, but I don't know about Mrs. Dole. I don't think the caucus is so much. Though. We have, we have Bachman now, we have Palin, we have Republican and Democratic examples for this question. Yeah, but are they going anywhere? Or is not the caucus system that does it? Okay, you have to No, it's not the caucus system. Some people sh should are not ready to run for president. There is in this country, if you study the political history of this country, there is a very strong, well, let me uh, go back a little bit. In Rome, they had something called, I mean, talking ancient Rome, the Republic. They had something called the cursus honorum. You had to move through the chairs, every bit as rigorous as if you were a Rotarian or a Shriner. Uh, and you had to do various jobs in the right order. Well, we in the United States have the same rule. The only person to get to be president from the House of Representatives was James Garfield, who had been a Civil War general and was a dark horse and there are v at a convention. And there are very few nominees who have gotten to the uh, nomination from the House of Representatives, William Jennings Bryan being the most recent in 1896. And they are usually ideological candidates, and that the fact that they're ideological candidates hampers them in their appeal to the general electorate. So uh, I, with the exception of Newt Gingrich, who has served as Speaker of the House, which is the equivalent of a national office, you, you have to get to be a viable candidate for president. You have to be a senator, a governor, a cabinet member, or a war hero. And there are almost no exceptions to that rule. So some of these people, I, I think that this is the Doris Kearns Goodwin election. Because all these people have read Team of Rivals. Just like uh, some of these other elections were based on Theodore White making as a president, all these people realize that if you stay in the race long enough and you appeal to the front runner and you bring something to the table, you can use that to negotiate a cabinet position or maybe a Senate run or something else. And that's why a lot of these people are in this race. Carolyn, uh, gender equality and the caucus system. The effect on yes. women. And I was just thinking as you were speaking about how Herman Cain is, was, I'm not sure right now what's going on, leading in all of the polls with, with no experience at, in terms of holding these offices. But I would say on women candidates, it's not my area. I'm sure this next panel, Tracy Osborne's my colleague, really is an expert in this area. But politics in general is, um, a difficult game for women candidates, and this means representative government as well. And so I think it would take a very careful analysis of all venues um, in terms of women's women's candidates. You know, before we start, any any other comments on the caucus system before we go to questions from the audience? I do have one more comment. Uh, on uh, 2008, uh, for your benefit, if you haven't seen the book Game Change, yeah. That is the book on the 2008 election so far. The general. And it, on, no, on the primary and uh, the nomination process as well. Uh, you can see the infighting in the Clinton campaign. You can see Obama's grand strategy and, and many strategies. But the great takeaway from the uh, a book is that uh, Hillary Clinton made a strategic mistake early on, given the nominating rules of the Democratic Party, 
which are not winner-take-all, but proportional representation. That is, she did not play, except in Iowa, in the caucus states, in the small states. She conceded those to President Obama and therefore uh, had a huge deficit to make up. And the second thing that happened is that when Chris Dodd dropped out of the race, President Obama was adopted by the Kennedys as a sort of honorary Kennedy. And they used their power within the Democratic Party to turn a great number of the uh, so-called superdelegates, which Hillary Clinton had counted on. And that is the story of the 08 election on the Democrat side. I'll, I'll share something with you that I haven't, haven't uh, talked about publicly, but I believe it. You talk about Romney spending a lot of time in Iowa and then dropping out. I mean, and then, pardon me, not dropping out, but then uh, finishing to second to Huckabee. But if you look at the pattern, you know in Iowa, you certainly know, Dean, and you know, that there is a strong uh, social conservative element within the Iowa Republican Party. And while Sam Brownback of Kansas was in the race, uh, that social element was divided between two candidates. When Brownback dropped out, it was Huckabee all the way with that faction of the Republican Party, and Romney uh, lost in Iowa, thereby clearing the way for McCain to win New Hampshire by appealing to the old Federalist element within the Republican Party, which is particularly strong in northern New England and upstate New York. Now, if you understand that, you have to ask yourself, did Brownback intend that result when he dropped out? He did support McCain after he dropped out. And I think there is every possibility that Romney didn't so much lose the Iowa caucuses in 2008 as he was outmaneuvered by uh, that combination, thereby permitting McCain to revive and go on and get the nomination. That's just my view. Interesting Thank that you. you would bring up the, the strength of the conservatives uh, within the Iowa Republican Party. I had a conversation just before we came and, and began here with... Uh, Larry, who's down here in the second uh, table, and uh, I'd like to have him speak, if you will, Larry. He's from Madrid, uh, which is just northwest of Des Moines, uh, still in Polk County he lives, though, and he caucuses there. But uh, I'd like to hear, have him say how he is moving within the Republican Party now. Uh, after, well, I'm not going to take your, your thunder. Go ahead, Larry. And, and how are you going to caucus? Stand up, if you will, so people can hear you. Take, take a mic, if you want. Yeah, go ahead. I'm not sure I'm comfortable in this position, but... but I, <laughs> and deal, yeah. if you will, with civility. All right. Well, I've been a Republican for a long time, until last January. I went to the courthouse in January and changed my registration to no party. A couple of months later, joined one of the organizations that's a sponsor of this event, which is No Labels. My first presidential, uh, my first opportunity to vote on a presidential campaign was when Barry Goldwater ran, when you had to be 21 in order to vote. And I bought the general Republican principles of self-reliance and personal responsibility and all of those kinds of things, which I still believe today. But that's been left in the past to the ideologues, the people who aren't interested in, in additional information that would shake up their package of prejudices in either party. When you see that kind of gridlock in Washington, D.C., where decisions on for the country's good can't be made. How can any of those people look in the mirror and say, I'm a patriot? They didn't put their country's needs first. And that's what leaves me behind in the dust, uh, saying a pox on both of your houses. And, uh, well, I'm really discouraged. Are you discouraged about civility within the Republican Party? I am. Uh, that's part of, of what gets to me. Uh, but this isn't unique to Republicans. It has made me ashamed to be a Republican because of how my party has acted, the representatives of them. Acted in what way? 
as I say, I think they're, they're simply trying to back up their own prejudices. When you, when you listen to the people debate, generally speaking, not all of them, they haven't a clue about how the economy works. They don't care that they don't know. And that's the scary part. Now, that's not just true of them. If we had a, if we had a rule of Democrats, you'd have the same kind of thing. But the civility of it, they shoot at one another, they don't get to the issues. It just never comes up. Thank you for sharing that. Bill? That's your party. The uh, distinct difference between the American system and most European systems is where coalitions are formed. In Europe, they form the coalition after the election. Uh, people get elected, and in many cases, they have proportional representation systems. Israel has the same problem. Splinter parties uh, get little shares of the vote, and the coalition is worked out by negotiation after people are elected. Uh, in Iowa and in the uh, nation, the co process of coalition formation begins right now, and January 3rd is a signal event in the process of coalition formation. Uh, the parties do it differently. Uh, the Republican Party sends a signal through the straw poll and then elects delegates to the county convention and precinct committeemen to govern the county parties. The Democrats have the system of uh, proportional representation and viability groups and uh, uh, delegate equivalents, but it's the same purpose. It's to uh, create a coalition of interests and ethnic groups and idea groups within the party uh, to hopefully go on and govern uh, in the state and nation. So if you have no uh, party group that appeals to you, my suggestion is, quite frankly, start a third party in your county and uh, get people who agree with you and form a coalition with them and run a candidate uh, in a local election, particularly at the city level, where the party label isn't uh, determinative. Uh, and I'll close at that point with one comment from one of my favorite Iowa political scientists, Donald Call, <laughs> who the register has brought back. He said many years ago that the difference between the Republican conventions and the Democrat conventions was that the, Rep that the Republicans thought they had a divided convention if everybody didn't say the Pledge of Allegiance. The Democrats thought they had a united convention if nobody started a third party. And Bill, but I'm, oh, I'm sorry. No, I didn't no, see no, you, you go I ahead. Didn't, so I you, didn't see you. You have just a quick comment. But I'm going to, I am going to respectfully say this. I think that that, that, that you came up here was very brave. I don't know how he made you do that, so thank you. Um, but I'm going to suggest that you didn't speak to this. I just, you know, I never, never, never try to pin Matt down on the national stuff because he, he's neutral, he can't be, and I don't want to put him in a spot. But it is the case with Maggie Tinsman sitting there, an absolute heroine of mine from the time I was very young, the Republican Party, I think we're afraid to say this as Democrats because then we don't want to look like we're all like pointing fingers. We got plenty of stuff on our side. Trust me, I know more about it now than I used to. But I will say that the Republican Party, as a national matter and as a state matter, you mentioned Bob Vanderplatz. I believe that Bob Vanderplatz has been one of the most dangerous Iowans to rise in the last 15 years in this state. I believe that it has been bad for the Republican Party. I believe that it's been bad for civic discourse and civil discourse. And I actually, as a citizen, taking off the whole half thing, I, you know, party chairs come and go, and I'll come home when I'm done with this gig and, you know, go back to finding an honest job. But the, the, the level of discourse that has happened on that side, I find to be heartbreaking. You guys, uh, is, it, is it discourse? Is the problem discourse? I, I don't see the problem as discourse. Honestly, I don't. I think that that's a Band-Aid. Your comments actually are the truth. I feel like both of our parties are have not been able to respond to the basic policy needs of the country. Jobs, the economy, the debt, wars, so many of the problems. And I, I feel like that we are 
they're increasing nonpartisan and disaffiliated Americans, and that I feel like both parties are going to need to re are going to need to find a way to reinvent themselves for the 21st century and to be maybe not just more civil, but more effective in terms of public policy and finding solutions. That's my opinion. So I, 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 I think your comments were You know, there's an old secret uh, or saying in programming that is quit while they're wanting more. <laughs> and I've just been handed this about five minutes ago, so I'm going to take that, and I'm sorry that, uh, but I think, okay, all right. Okay, uh, Sue, can I respond to that? Of course. I, I am not conscious in my own mind of any motivation whatsoever to put this gentleman down for his discomfort with the Republican Party. I, I am genuinely suggesting that if the Republican Party has become hostile to his uh, interests or views, that he has two choices. One is to do what Barry Goldwater said back in 1964, or 60, when uh, Nixon and Rockefeller made the settlement of Fifth Avenue, or whatever they called it. Uh, and uh, Goldwater said, uh, Let's grow up conservatives. If we want to take over, take this party back, and I think we can someday, we have to do the work. So I think that there, that one of the choices that anyone has is to compete for power and influence within the party. One of the things that I have seen now, Maggie Tinsman is an exception, tremendous exception. Uh, a lot of moderate Republicans have lain down and allowed, uh, people to drive them out of the party. Uh, and I believe that they need to come back in and take Barry Goldwater's advice from the other point of view. That's my view. But if they feel that they can't do it or if the environment is too hostile to them and they don't wish to become Democrats, then their answer is to start uh, an independent movement. And I say that as a student of political science and not as a person uh, as a combatant in this case. I just wanted you to know that. Now, the other thing I would say about that is that none of this is new. The anti-slavery movement took over the Whig Party in the same way, by being single-minded and hostile uh, to those who weren't. And they took some beatings, literal beatings, for it from the Democrats. James Weaver and the Greenbackers in Iowa. The uh, Anti-Saloon League and the uh, Dries. And, uh, and in the Democratic Party, the anti-war movement in the 60s and early 70s. So I'm just saying, yeah. this is nothing new. And what looks like an uncivil moment right now may just be an ongoing process of realignment. And in 10 years, we'll look back on it and say, hey, so that's what that was about. But I think our panelists uh, for the next uh session have just come into the room and so I would just I would just say I think they these panelists here have been terrific and thank you very much.